Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our CS Supporters webinar. I'm Jamila Smoy, 17-year-old entrepreneur, and I'm thrilled to be here. My involvement with CS Supporters is driven by my dedication to supporting children affected by parental incarceration. CS Supporters raises awareness about and supports children of incarcerated parents. It's also a community for young people who may feel like they are alone, so they can remember they are not. The Osborne Association began SUSU in New York in 2015 and is now a national initiative. One in 14 children experience parental incarceration. This year's theme for SUSU Month is about navigating the challenges of our parents' reentry. The youth team has been hard at work crafting a script and a promo video, sharing valuable tips, creating TikTok content, and recording a re-entry podcast, which you guys should check out. Tonight, we'll discuss our re-entry experiences, what worked, what didn't, and the unexpected. Before we dive into our discussion, let's briefly meet our panelists. They'll introduce themselves, sharing their proudest accomplishments and reasons for joining SUSU. My name is Chantel. I am 24. I live in Manhattan and I'm currently pursuing a bachelor's in Ayurvedic wellness. And I got involved with SUSU um, this year as this year's uh, youth fellow. And I got involved because uh, I was affected by parental incarceration. So I thought it'd be really powerful to be the person that I needed during those experiences for other young people. Um, I guess I can go next. So um, I'm Ava Martoma. Um, I'm the co-founder of Kidsmates, which is a nonprofit um, that works alongside the Osborne Association in helping children to develop resilience in the face of parental incarceration. Um, so currently I'm located in New Jersey right now and I've joined the SUSU youth, youth team for a few years. Um, I've been here, I think three, maybe four years now. Um, and uh, one of my proudest accomplishments is um, that I'd love to share that Kidsmates um, won the T-Mobile um, Change Maker Challenge and we were the equity in action category winners this year, um, which is really exciting. Could go next. Um, I'm Avalyn Terry. I was the SUSU Youth Fellow in 2021. That's how I first got involved with SUSU. Um, and I'm a human rights activist and I'm located on Long Island, New York. Dad. Hi, I'm uh, Jermaine Jackson, no relation. Um. I got involved with SUSU through my my daughter, which is Chantel Jackson, and she uh, hit me to it. And I realized it's a very important thing and a very helpful thing to, to have going on. And I really love the organization and the things you guys do. I'm from New York, Bronx, New York, but I'm currently based out of uh, Seattle, Washington, where I've been for the past year. 
and I work at Alaska Airlines. And you know, I'm just excited to get this on. Hi, everybody. It's so nice meeting everyone. As mentioned prior, I'm Jamila. I'm a youth advocate and an entrepreneur, and I truly enjoy doing this work because it allows me to connect with individuals that feel like they don't have a voice in their community, and it's just reinforcing the change that's necessary. So we'd like to kick off our discussion with a video. The short film excerpts you're about to see is one of our series of narrative films written by formerly incarcerated artists. As part of the remaining myself re-entry program created by rehabilitation through the arts and organization with almost 30 years experience working inside and outside prison walls. The narrative films are used as part of the cur cur curriculum which focuses on the social and emotional access of re-entry. It serves as a jumping off Point to initiate conversations, spark hands-on activities, and work through challenging topics in a brave and initiative manner. So here's the video. Yo, 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 let me holla at you, man. Yo, come on, man, let me holla at you. Just, come on. Damn. I mean, your mom's told me you got an A on that essay, man. I'm going home, big bro. Yo, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I'm not surprised, though, man. You are never a knucklehead like me. How long have you been home? Two weeks. Looking good. <laughs> Say hello to my girl for me. Got hey, you. Vince. Look, man. I was out of pocket with you the other day. Could have handled that better. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm on the phone. You're not even doing anything, man. I'm looking right at you. I met your mom right over there. Same playground where you lost your two front teeth. You know, last time I got arrested. And I messed up a lot. I'm sorry for that. Yo, did you hear me? That's my man, Robbie May. He was locked up in a cell next to mine. Light skinned dude, that's his son, Chris. Took the picture up at Sing Sing. Yeah, man. Father and son doing time together. That messed me up, man. Is that what you wanted to talk to me about? Yeah, just hear me out. Because Chris is only a few years older than you. Him and Robbie were in different cells, but they see each other from time to time in the school building. Anyway, Robbie heard that some knuckleheads was gonna stab his son up. But what could he do? It's not like he can go to another cell block and protect his son. Long story short, Something went down to prison, they locked it down, had us locked in. Next thing you know, a sergeant comes in, tells Robbie that his son was stabbed up and he was in critical condition. Just like that, and then he left. I was up all night. Couldn't sleep all night because Robbie was in his cell crying because he couldn't protect his son. And I made you think about me. You, my life, how I had to change? Yo, I never thought about it like that before, man. I never thought about the times that I hurt you and failed you. So it took you going back to prison this last time just for you to realize that you would never really give a fuck about me and my moms? 
Bro, is that what you're saying? Yo, I always loved you and your mother. Even when I was out here hustling in the streets, I made sure that you had everything you needed. What I needed was a father. Not some bum going back and forth to prison. Yeah, that's right, I said it. If you loved me, you would've thought about how what you was doing would affect me. But you didn't care. I'm supposed to believe you about some bullshit that happened in prison would've changed you? Nah. Nah, bro, I don't think so. Yo, what do you want me to say? I messed up. All right, I messed up. But I'm being real with you right now, man. You being real with me? What that thing you got from that dude the other day? Yeah, yeah, I heard you on the phone. I was afraid you was listening. <laughs> Back to them old habits that got you locked up in the first place. So I guess all that shit you were saying about how you changed was a lie, right? You not give me a chance to explain? Bro, you lied to me knowing how much I loved you. I need you to be my father. Like, why would you try to play me like that? Get the fuck out of here, I asked my man to hit me off with a few dollars until I get back on my feet. Just wanted to get you a little something nice to show you how proud I am of you. Just want you to give me another chance, man. That's all I'm asking. Please. You want me to trust you? I won't let you down. I promise. I mean, you said you love me, right? Because you ain't never said that shit before. Yeah, man, I do. If you want me to believe you, just don't leave. Just don't leave again. So, you know, how do you guys feel about that clip? What are your thoughts? I love how, I'll kick us off. I love how it was a reality check and it really showcased what a lot of people encounter when their parent comes back home from prison or jails so it was a very real emotional and it was a powerful message behind it and i related to it as well yeah i agree that's why i, I picked that you know snippet specifically because um a lot of the times parents will feel guilty or insecure because of you know their financial status or their you know their outward material value when the child isn't really concerned about that and it, it really showcases how the emotional support um means more and is more valuable than anything else that you can give to a child i definitely agree with that i feel like what they really showed is that this Although the child was showcasing like he didn't really care, but inside he was seeking a relationship from his father. He just seek like he wanted his father to be there with him in that moment. And he wanted he feared that his father would be gone again. It also gets really real talking about like you've never even said you love me and now you want to come home and act like you love me. Um, I think that says a lot about like, even as you're older and your relationship can develop with your parent, like personally, like my parents turned more into parents in my adult years than they were in my children years. And that, that can be really hard for me sometimes. Um, and it, it definitely gets reflected in that video. It kind of show like, um, how the child was feeling like emotionally, emotionally neglected, but 
you know, they weren't aware of that until that very moment. Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of showcases all the deep emotions that occur and how it's not just one feeling about how there's like many different things that you can feel at once. And like you can see in the video how there are some like feelings of hesitance, but there's also like feelings of intrigue and like wanting to establish that relationship. And I think that that's really important in characterizing like what happens when a parent comes home. Dad, how'd that make you feel seeing that from a father um, perspective? Yeah, for me, it was it was very relatable because I kind of went through the same thing with you. You know, when I first came back, it was times where I felt like I could do a lot more financially to, to, to support you guys, you and your sister. When And at the end of the day, you used to always tell me you don't care what I have. It's about spending time with me and me being there for you guys. And I definitely made a, a note of that to try to do my best to stay afloat and not put myself in a situation where I would be absent in you guys' life again, because that's that was very meaningful. And, and the most important thing was to just be there for you guys, you know? And when you told me that, and like, I really felt that. And seeing that with him, the the, the kid in the video, how he stated that, you know, just don't leave me again. And that was powerful. To me, that was powerful. And I can tell by that interaction that he doesn't, the dad doesn't want to be in a situation where, you know, he's not able to provide. And and you're only left with certain things that you can do to feed yourself and feed your family and don't want to feel less than as a, as a man, as a provider. But you have to be mindful not to put yourself in situations that could lead you back in the same situation that you were in previously and then you will end up getting taken away as you know for me uh i don't even jaywalk i'm not doing anything to put myself in the situation to be taken out of your lives again and i won't jeopardize that you know but it was definitely powerful powerful um powerful messages in that and it was very relatable thank you for sharing and uh I didn't expect to be crying this early. Like we just got here. <laughs> I'm sorry because I got personal. See, I'm gonna <laughs> keep it on the eye. I told you that previously. I'm gonna know. keep it on the eye. Okay. Yeah. So you know, now we're gonna you know get into our one on one convo. Okay. And um, if you guys want, you can turn your cameras off. Um. So, one of the first questions I want to ask is, how did you feel about you know, coming home? And especially coming home knowing you wouldn't live with your children. For me, it was tough because I wasn't prepared for that, for being away for so long and actually not having contact with you guys. So I didn't really know what to expect. I knew it was going to be tough. I was somewhat, somewhat, you know, I, I didn't really know which direction to go because after being in a, in a, uh, in that situation for so long, everything was laid out for you. But now that I was free, you know, I have to make these decisions on my own and make sure they're the right decisions, you know, and I knew that I wanted to build a relationship with you guys, but I knew I had to get myself situated first, try to establish some type of, you know, some type of foundation because it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense for me to like, to try to reach out to you guys if I'm doing the wrong thing, that's going to, you know, eventually put me back in that same situation. So I had to be patient, you know, keep a positive attitude about things, positive outlook, and just, you know, just keep trying and, and working hard. And I knew it wasn't going to be easy because at first, like I said, it was kind of, it was kind of scary, you know, being back out in the world and starting from zero, you know, just starting from the bottom and just trying to work my way up, not even knowing where my children are at the moment, you know, so it was kind of tough. Did you expect to like not see us often? Or... Um, often I I don't not I wouldn't say often, but I know I knew that once I did get in contact with you guys, no matter where you at, you guys were at, I was gonna make an effort to be in the same vicinity. You know, smooth things over with your mom as best as I could. So you know, let her know it's it's 
Like, we're going to co-parent this thing. I'm going to be involved. And you see the next move I did after that. I was on parole, but I still came to, <laughs> I came to yeah. be with you guys. I didn't care. I didn't care. I made an effort to try to be with you guys because I missed so much. You know, and I didn't want to miss anything else. You know, so, yeah. So you did face, like, familial barriers when you came home. So, like, what were those like? Um, the barriers, a lot of barriers that I, I faced were, like, of course, like, discrimination in regards to me being a thug. No, like, from fam family. Family, fam yeah. family barriers. Oh, family barriers, Um, you know, like, for me, coming back out, it's like, it was tough because, you know, it's a trust thing and people look at you differently knowing that you've been in that situation they look at you differently and in some ways people fear you fear you you know and and I knew coming out I wasn't going to have that type of negative attitude I didn't want people to look at me like I was some some sort of like like you know violent person or anything like that you know so it was tough because putting like me not being able to be in you guys life when I first came out it was tough, you know, and I, and I did what I could to get in contact with you guys, and I was being patient, and, you know, after, it took a year, and eventually, you know, your mom reached out because, um... Really? You're already out for a whole year? I was, I came out in, in 2008, and I came out in yeah. 2008, February, you know, and... And it took me a while to get in contact with you guys. And I actually did it through your grandpa, uh, Grandpa Keith. I did it through him, you know, and I spoke to him for a while. And then he got in contact with your mom. And then after that, she gave me a call. I was like, I was surprised. When she gave me a call, we had a long talk. And then lo and behold, the next day I was over there. <laughs> I was over there. The wow, next day. I, I am shocked. Out. Wow. I was in I was in Mount Vernon. I, I I had to take off some time from from the job that I had, and I had to make it my business it comes to you guys. And you remember the first meet, so it came to the point where I didn't even really want to go home, and you guys were in a whole other borough, and knowing I had to go to work the next day, I missed you guys so much. I just wanted to be around you guys, but I have responsibilities as well, so I had to make it work. I had to make right. it work. Yeah, but it was tough. It was definitely tough. Wow. So what because would you tell, like... Because everybody's not going to accept you. Huh? Because everybody is not going to accept you, you know, because you have a past and, and things like that. I don't know. I didn't know how, you know, I would be perceived like a, a violent person or a negative person being that I was away for so long and I didn't know if your mom would think that I was harboring any ill feelings towards her. Not even just mom. I'm surprised that... It was her side of the family that helped. I I did not yeah, know. That. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah. Because because you know I'm I'm quite sure like people like even though your grandpa I, I I know he felt what I felt with that. You know he seen me with you guys. He know how I felt about you guys. So to have that ripped away from me for so long, you know, and and I guess he wanted to see what I would do with that information, and he passed it on to your mom, and your mom gave me a chance. You know, she gave me a chance and it worked out. It worked out, you know, and I'm happy. I'm glad that she did. Yeah. So what is, um like, what would you tell parents whose children don't want to have a relationship with them or the family doesn't support the children having a relationship when the parent comes home? Um, The biggest thing for me, like, I'm going to keep touching on that is being patient. Because you can't force anything. You can't force anything. But but the thing you have to do is be consistent in what you say. Practice what you preach. You can't sit here and say, you know, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that because, you know, I wanna show you guys I'm I'm a good I'm a good father and I love you guys. But then you go out and do something that's gonna put a strain on the relationship. You know, just try to stay in conducive situations and positive situations and keep that up and just keep keep trying. You know, the door is going to get slammed in your face a couple of times. Hey, I understand. You have to understand that, that they're hurt because you weren't around. You know, it was times when they needed you and you weren't around. So for me, I, I really understand that. And even that if at first, first getting back with you guys, if you guys would have felt some type of way, like, 
Like you, you guys didn't really want me around, and it's 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 not like a blame thing. I know that's on me. That's on me because I wasn't around. So I, you have to be able to take accountability for that. So anything you guys are saying that that hurt, like how he took his chain, the chain that he gave him, and slammed it on the floor. Like I, I know it was like that was tough, but it wasn't about that. It was about you being here. So I don't want to try to build a relationship, but you now you're telling me you love me again, but you're gonna just go away again. You know, so you just kind of have to, you're going to have to just make an effort to just stay on the right path so you don't have to be in that situation again. And for me, that's that's one of the main things, like being patient and just staying focused on what's important. And at the end of the day, is that bond that you have with your children because you're supposed to protect them. You're supposed to love them. You're supposed to provide for them, be there for them any way you can. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to be the, the richest person in the world. It's not about money. It's about showing them that you actually care, you know. I, just being there, just uh, acknowledging that they're, 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 like he said in the beginning, I noticed that you got an A on your on your uh, test. You got an A on your test. Just acknowledging that, like just, you know, being there, showing some form of support in any way that you can. But it has to be consistent. It has to be consistent, you know, even though, you know, you get mighty a little attitude, you know, but hey, it is what it is. You're the parent. You got to accept that. You have to deal with that. You have to bridge that gap and, you know, smooth it out as best as you can. And for me, like, right. I, didn't, yeah. I didn't really have to go through that because you know how we were. Yeah. Um, when we came back, you know how we were. So, yeah. you know, it's, but yeah, I just feel like, who's... you know, for like the other parents, um, right. the consistency really does help with that because. If it's like a one and done thing, like if you acknowledge me like once and it's not mm -hmm. consistent, I'm going to feel like it's fake. I'm going to feel like you're just doing this because you think this is what parents do and it doesn't right. feel as authentic and um, genuine, you know? Right. So. It's not enough. Yeah. It's not enough. Kind of reminds me of from that, that movie, Don't Drink Your Juice in the Hood, when Sean Wayans came and he picked up his son. He said, hey, I came to see my son. He picked him up. And he put him down. He said, same time. Next right, week. right, like, right. That's it. Seriously. That's it, right? That's, no, you have to be more consistent. You have to be more, more, more in, into engaging with your child. Like, you have to be there a lot more than that. That's not enough. Right, um, right. You have to be more of an effort. So, um, in terms of, like, society, like, communities, right. did you, well, I think you, you already said it, like, um, if you felt like judged or accepted coming back into society. So you did start, you said like discrimination. Right. Right. Um, yeah. It, it was definitely tough being, being a felon trying to get reacclimated into the work field because prior to that, I was always, I was a working person anyway. I always try to maintain some type of, you know, employment, some type of means of income, you know, so I was already like kind of prepared for it. And I knew what it would take, and and with these with this extra thing on my back, you know, with the with the felony, you know, it kind of discouraged me a little bit because I always felt like I can go out for this this position, I can try to do this and do that, and and not get the results that I was looking for. And when that happens, it can discourage you. It can definitely discourage you, knowing that you have to, you know, take care of yourself and show everybody that you you're not that type of person you were previously, you know, and it, it takes a lot of patience as well. That's very important. I'm going to keep reiterating on that because that's important. You have to have that patience. You have to have that drive and you have to have a positive outlook. You know, you can't be pessimistic about things, you know, just think, feel like because some doors get slammed in your face. So now you, you don't want to go after other opportunities that you can better yourself. So you can, you can actually, have the time and 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 create that create that 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 bridge that you can build on with your loved ones and stuff like that you know so it was definitely tough having to deal with that but it can be discouraging but you just have to keep keep pushing just keep pushing you know yeah so how are you staying like so positive like despite all of the barriers and the stigma because it's, it's no nowhere else to go but up. Because if 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 I if I look look at it from a negative perspective, I'm not gaining anything out of that. And then I have the people I, I say love me, 
that that I love, and I'm sitting there making a bunch of excuses as to why I'm not trying to progress, it's it's gonna it's gonna show that you know like I have doubts of myself, and that's not a good example to set. I can't sit here and tell you when you're going through something like yo, yeah, you should just keep pushing, keep keep striving for. You know you can do it. You know you're smart, you're talented. This that, and the third, but I don't use that same type of information on myself as far as practicing what you preach. So, you know, you have to have confidence in yourself. So, you know, you feel like you can overcome anything because you, I'm back for a reason. I'm here for a reason. If I wasn't intended to to be a free man, to, to, to do things, and I wasn't allowed the chance to be back in my children's life, what am I doing? I'm just wasting time, wasting time and energy. You know, I'm wasting time and energy when I could use, utilize that to be a productive member of society and also be in a healthy, healthy uh, situation, a, a dis, a, not a dysfunctional family lifestyle, but a functional one, health, healthy relationships. You know, that's important, whether it be friends, whether it be family, whether it be coworkers, you know, you just have to, you have to look into positive relationships because that energy that you're putting out, you get it back. You know, you're going to get that same energy back. And after that, you, you know, Everything is up from there. You just gotta just keep pushing, and that that positive energy, it it, it you know it, it 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 weighs on other people too, and then they they feel it, and then two positives, two positives, you know that's gonna do. It's gonna just make everything a lot easier. You know, is this is nobody wants negative Nancys around. Them. Nobody wants that. Nobody likes that that, right. that whole negative vibe. Okay. You know? So confidence was like at the forefront of everything that helped. Confidence uh, and a positive mindset. Confidence, mindset, and and being patient. That it's not an overnight thing. It's never going to be an overnight thing. And it's patience is a virtue, is cliche, but it, it works in almost every aspect of everything in life. Yes, you know, it does. It you really have to does. Utilize that. And yes, it, it, that's a big thing for me. And I, I, I touch on that, but don't get too it's sometimes people mistake mistake um um what's what's the word being complacent in the situation or being um like a days ago or just procrastinating don't procrastinate because it's a difference between being patient and procrastinating you know some things that you know is there you know you, you and you just want to you should go out and grab it while it's still available, while it's still there for you. You know, you just don't want to sit there. You know, no, I want to. I want to call my daughter. I want to go set this up, but I'm going to wait. You know, until I get some money. I want to go see her, but I'm gonna wait till I go get some money or this, that, and the third. Where well, I can bring her something nice when I come over. You remember when I used to do that? I don't just yeah. want to show up empty-handed, and, and you be like, you know, it's not about that. Your presence is more, more. It's priceless. It's the value, yes. Else. It's, no, that's, that's that's priceless more than anything that you can buy from you. You know exactly. And, and I never forgot that. You know that's that's definitely important. You know so. So, yeah. um, you don't have any questions for me? None. Um, and questions, questions for you is with 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 from the amount of time that I was enabled to be in your life and then being like almost reintroduced to me again because you were a baby almost it was like three years old two years old when I uh, got incarcerated and then after seeing you for so long like what did you expect from me after that um I didn't even expect to ever see you I already didn't know what you look like so Okay. I kind of came to terms with me just not having a dad. And right. plus, like, you know how mom is? It's like my mom, she's like, I'm your right. mom and your dad. So I'm right. like, well, this is it. I, I don't have a dad. Like, that's right. just what it is. My mom is my dad. Um, So it was like, I feel like I didn't even really process it. Like when you came that day and I seen you, like, especially like, it was just like, I didn't see you for a long time again after that. So I'm just like going through the rest of my days like, oh, wait, yeah, I actually do have a dad and I did see him recently. So it was like something I didn't come to terms with or process or accept 
because of that, you know, lack of consistency. And right. it's, I know now, like the lack of consistency wasn't even on you. Um, right. It was all those other barriers. Right. Um, so it felt unreal. Like that's the best way I can describe it. Cause I didn't have an image of you in my mind. I didn't know what you looked like and there are no pictures. So it was just like a, a empty slot in my mind. And um, yeah, it was unreal. I don't think I really like fully accepted it until like when you came to live with us for that little bit when I was like um, 10, 11, because right. there, that's when the consistency came. You know, yeah. we're playing video games, we're playing basketball, we're playing chess, yeah. like the, the thing was there, like the normal parent dynamic, you know, was there and it took patience because, you know, from what, nine to 11, like it took a little while, but, you know, um, I sat there and I processed that for a very long time until it felt real, you know, and the yeah. presence is what made it feel real, you know, nothing else. Right. So, yeah. Okay. That's beautiful. And someone said something in the chat. They asked, how is our relationship now? I want you to touch on that topic. It's that great. This this <laughs> is my bestie. This is my best friend right here. Yep. You know, yep. I did not let the lack of a relationship while he was, I didn't speak to him at all, you know, while he was incarcerated. So I didn't let that bother me. And when I first met him, I already knew like, this is my best friend. Like this is, this is, I know we don't do favorites, but this is it right here, you know? This is like my twin. And, you know, even though we we had, you know, when I was still a teenager, like our little rough patches, I always acknowledge that, you know, this is, if I don't have nobody, like it's my dad, you know, um, one of the smartest people I know, um, you know, lets nothing get the best of him. And yeah, it's, it's inspiring. He's an inspiration. So are you, babe. So are you. Ah, you guys are so nice in the chat. <laughs> uh, it's tough um, for me to ask okay. It's tough for um. Me to so yeah, when you when you came home, right? What kind of like support did you have? Like, who was helping you? You know, become um, the good parent you are today. Um. As as far as helping me, like, I I did I did. Uh, take some some programs while I was incarcerated. You know, I took anger management, which is ART, and I also took um I took like some rehabilitation uh programs as far as like uh AA and NA and stuff like that. Even though that I didn't think I didn't think I needed it at the time because I didn't feel like I had any problems with the drugs or anything like that. But it was deeper than that. It's the other things that's involved within it. You know that can that can build you up to a point where you feel like you know like when everything is against you, the world's against you, everything is crashing down on you. Like there is hope. There's always a way out. You know, it's how you cope with things, and and, and it gave me some good coping skills and stuff like that, and some good tools that I utilize in my life still to this day. You know, but I haven't went to meetings or anything in such a long time. I haven't yeah. done any of that stuff. But just knowing that, you know, just knowing that it's it's things that I can do to 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 combat any negative feelings or thoughts that I may may be having in regards to anything in my life. You know, you know, they say sometimes you like to go to your happy place when you're feeling some type of way. You know, and for me, you're part of that. You know, you're part of that. And like just seeing you progress and you came a long way. We spoke on that previously. You came a long way in the past two years. You've made huge strides, huge strides in 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 a lot of different areas, you know. And we touched on that, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. But with with that being said, it's like you you and and seeing your relationship currently, your relationship with 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 my uh, future son-in-law—that's that's my guy. You know that already. 
you know, and I just love seeing you guys together. I just love hearing you guys together. Like, and it's like, it's just a beautiful thing because it's, it's a healthy relationship. And that's rare nowadays, you know, especially for young, young, young people to have that because there's not too many inspirations that's out there in regards to relationships, you know, and stuff like that. There's so many negative things out, people not trusting each other and so forth and whatever the case may be. But just seeing that with you guys, is it's just a, a blessing to me. And that kind of helps me as well. You know, like that's, that's, that's true love. That's real love. It's healthy, you know, and it's nothing better than that to me, you know, cause everything after that just, just, it comes together. Once you, once you have that, that love in your heart, you have that, that, that support system. And, and it, it's, it's like your ceiling is, is you have no ceiling, you know, sky's the limit with that, you know, but it's very important to have that support system, which I, I didn't really have when I came out like that. What was, and, um, remember that program you was in? What was the name of the program? Yeah, the Doe Fund, the Doe Fund, Ready, Will, and Enable, that was like, um, that was a program for, you know, for um, homeless men, for homeless men trying to, you know, get themselves together, which they had ways of keeping people sober and keeping people sober and, you know, off the streets and, 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 and employed, gainfully employed and learning uh, valuable skills and stuff like that you know it's they help you with housing they also help you with 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 getting a license your driver's license they help you get different positions and stuff like that and they also have computer courses and classes and stuff like that that you can take that can help you you know but if you if for any men i don't know if they have women in it now because it was such a long time ago ready willing and able yet it was such a long time ago it was just a men from what i understood but I don't know, they, they probably changed it by now. But it, they definitely uh, set the ground rules for people who want to help themselves and better themselves. You have to do the work. No one's going to do the work for you. You have to do the work. And, you know, it's, 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 it's tough when you really don't have anybody. Oh, we're, like, and running out know. of time. But I have, like, two more questions I really, really want to ask. So try to, right. you know... Uh, right. You no. Know, and I see questions and best. stuff up there too. And I, I yeah, with the Q and A, like questions. we're gonna answer whatever questions you guys have. The Q and A right. will be um towards the end of the panel. I see your question, Regina. Um, yeah. So the first one would be, when was the first time you felt stability? And if this hasn't happened yet, what would make you feel stable? Um. To me, what would make me feel stable is like if I'm in it. I was like that previously, you know, for like the past past what twelve years, ten years. I was in another relationship with someone that I truly loved, and today happens to be her birthday. You know, happy birthday, cat! I love you and I miss you. But she unfortunately passed away, as you know, and. Well, excuse me. Um, and with with that, it's like uh, it's tough, but you know, you just wanna just keep progressing in any way you can. But I kind of got off topic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You don't have to answer if you what don't want to. Again? No. What was the question again? Hold on. It's, let's bring it back. Was when question? was the first time you felt stability? I know it was when yeah, you had yeah, got yeah, together. Yeah when I had that, when I had that relationship and it was a stable household, you know, it was very positive. It was very functional, you know, unlike what I was, was used to dealing with growing up and it just made me feel whole. And I was able to have a relationship with you. I was able to have a relationship with, uh, Leah, which is my granddaughter, you know, and, it was just so many positive relationships around me at that time. Like I really felt great about it, you know. And even though I, I didn't have the type of income that I feel like I want to have, but at you the deserve, end of the day, it's not about yeah, that. yeah, that I deserve. It's not about that, you know. It's not about that. It's when you're at peace in your life and and 
everything is just clicking on, on all cylinders, you know, and stuff like that. Like, I, I really had that within that relationship. And when I lost that, you know, you were there to, uh, to, to help me, you know, and a couple of other people were as well to help me through that. And now um, kind of going through the process of getting that stability back, you know, I uh, moved to a whole nother state, way on the West Coast, which I've never been, you know, and it's, it's, it's it hasn't been easy, you know, but I met someone that, that's, that's really nice as well, you know, from what I feel, they're good for me, you know, and I've been accomplishing a lot, you know, I've been moving up in the ranks at work, I'm looking in the dude side ventures as far as opening my own business and stuff like that you know and and just seeing you progress like that's like to me like the best feeling the best feeling seeing you progress seeing Tanaya progress you know she's progressing and you know what both of you guys have been through to see how you guys trying out of all of that it's, it's, it's inspirational to me and you know that that gives me that stability that I, I, I need to know that is anything that I need, anything that 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 you guys need, like we can be there for each other and stuff like that. And there's no hesitation, there's no problem. There's nothing for me to just hop on a flight because I got benefits with the airport. So <laughs> there's nothing for me to hop on a flight and come down there and be with you guys and vice versa. That's why I'm in a process of moving, you know, process of moving. I just got into a, a home, you know, which I'll have more space for you guys to come visit and stuff mm -hmm. like that as well. And, you know, I'm going to be gardening. There's a chicken coop in the back. I'll put some chickens mm -hmm. in there. So, you know, I've done stuff like that. I want to get involved with it, you know, because it's peaceful and serene. You know, that's that's a good thing. You know, that, that would definitely help to keep that positive energy and spirit up, you know, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad we got to have the conversation. That's Me you know too. that's all on my part. That's all I have to ask, and uh, I learned a lot. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing, Dad. Thank I you, love you. Thank you. Love you too. Love you more. <laughs> um. So as for the other panelists, um, you know, you guys can turn your cameras back on and share like what about my dad and I what about our convo um you know resonated hit home uh made you think about something I really appreciated um of course there there are youth who don't have the best relationship with their parents but I can definitely appreciate like the similar relationship you guys have to my dad and I, where like, you're just buddies now. Um, and, you know, like you went through this really horrible process that all of us on this panel have gone through. Um, and you've been able to come out still as you and um, to have one another to lean on is really powerful. And it was great to listen to the two of you, like get to connect like that. That was awesome. Thank you, Ava. Thanks for listening to. I think also like what you guys talked about, um, like the development of your relationship, despite like the barriers that were in place. Like, I know you talked about like how you didn't always have like contact with your dad, even after he came back. And I think just like, how you fought kind of to keep that connection is a really strong message because I think um, sometimes it feels easier just to let it go, um, but fighting for it is super important. I agree. It's so much more easier to just, you know, let things yeah. fall to the side and be cast aside. But, you know, as an adult, I can do a little bit on my own part as well. You know, as a child, I can never. That's when we got into the things we would get into more bickering when I was a teenager but as an adult you know we'll have our emotional conversations and get it all out and just keep it pushing you know keep going forward
How about you, Jamela? It was definitely amazing to see how you guys interacted, how your hear how your relationship has grown over time. And I'm just so happy for you. I was sitting here listening. I'm like, oh, I can see that like it as the conversation was happen, happening, your inner child was healing because you were finding out things that you never even knew before. So I'm definitely happy for you. You're very deserving of that. So yeah. Thank you. It always feels good to like, you know, hear a parent like, you know, uh, push you and like big up you because like, especially when they're gone and it's like, I need that. And you could get it from anybody else. But like when it comes from like the people who birthed you, it just hits, it hits different, you know. So I'm glad like everyone is here to experience and witness it um, with my dad and I. And, you know, thank you guys for sharing. Um, yeah, so let's get into the rest of the panel. Um, for starters, uh, how did, uh, you guys prepare for your parents' reentry while they were incarcerated? Like, and how did you maintain a relationship? Anyone can go first because, you know, I already did my piece kind of with that one. Eight. All right. Okay. I'll All kick right. us off. For me, I didn't really maintain that much of a relationship. I got phone calls here and there, and it was more like of a I was seeking a relationship more than my incarcerated loved one was. Mm. How about you, um, Ava M? How did you like prepare for the reentry? Um, yeah, so I think for me, my dad came out during um COVID. So I think like in some ways I had time to prepare because like obviously like I'd been trying to like my mom and I we'd all been trying to like have that like process get him out of getting him out happen. So like I did know, but also in like my grand scheme of things, like I think he was supposed to be there for longer than I like expected um and I was definitely so happy to have him out earlier um but it was just sort of like that rush timeline um towards the end and I think a lot of it was because it was COVID times um I had a lot more time at home with him and I think that really helped um to like foster our relationship and things like that but um I think a big part of it was just like I had kept in contact with my dad, which I was really lucky to be able to do during his incarceration. And I think part of it meant that the transition for him coming back home was a little bit easier. Obviously, like there were differences um, in like having him over the phone versus him like in my house. And like that was definitely very different. Um, but I think it's just like something you explore as it happens. For my experience, um, yeah, because my mom was also incarcerated. It was kind of like the complete opposite. Like we kept in contact during her incarceration because she would write me a lot and she would call me and, um, you know, Chips would take me to go see her. But um, we didn't have like a relationship when she came out because towards like the end of her sentence, uh, we got into, you know, an altercation and so there really wasn't any preparing for her reentry because I did not expect to have a relationship with her when she came out. But surprisingly, you know, you know, the universe work in mysterious ways because now we have a relationship over the last few months. And, you know, by the grace of God, we do because me and that lady do not get along at all. Um, but we're doing so well now and, you know, I'm so proud of her for actually, um, you know, accepting that the reentry process is not linear because she struggled a lot coming back into society and she may still struggle a lot now, but I get to, it's like kind of like roles reverse. I get to be her support system and, you know, be someone that she can you know, that can breathe, I can be someone that can breathe life into her. 
And I know she be needing that. So it's a blessing that I was able to work through my own stuff, um, you know, to be there for her, regardless if I'm the child or not, you know. Um, so yeah, Ava, Ava L. So when my dad came home, I was six, so I wasn't doing much preparing for him to come to come home. Um, but I did make a sign for him, which was super exciting for me at the time. Um, and yeah, he he came home. At, I don't remember it. I just remember making a sign. Um, but it it was hard because he brought us these. Um, he made these like flowers out of toilet paper. Um, and he gave them to us and I thought that they were like really cool. And my mom was like, that's garbage. We're throwing that out. Um, so yeah, that was my experience when my dad came home. And you guys, did you guys have the relationship while he was there? Um, so we didn't speak at all while he was in jail. Um, my mom didn't want us to have contact with him, but once he came home, we kind of just like moved forward as if nothing had really happened. Um, especially cause I'm so little, like what kind of conversation can really even be had, um, that I'm sure a conversation could have been had, but there was <laughs> no conversation was had. Um, and then we kind of just like moved forward with life, um, where I was really resentful towards him. And I had, um, prejudiced against him because of the fact that he'd gone to jail, um, and it kind of just really disconnected us from the whole time of us, um, of me growing up and same thing with my mom, you know, she only went to jail for one night, but that still impacted us. Um, and she ended up with a whole bunch of, um, requirements for her felony that she had to meet, uh, that put stress on her ability to be employed and make it to work. Um, she wasn't allowed to drive and she had mandatory therapy that she had a really hard time getting to. Um, because there's no public transportation around here. So, yeah. So that, like, that lack of a relationship during the incarceration, like, do you think that impacted the reentry? Like, how, you know, how were you building your relationships, you know, once they came home? No, exactly. I think that's, like, the biggest part of it is that my dad's reentry kind of didn't even happen until I was older because he he was home physically, but there was no healing around our relationship or the impact or the toll that had been taken. Um, and I kind of just like ended up hating him for years. And like, we had a horrible relationship. I was a really relentless daughter. Um, and we, we didn't, we didn't get along at all until I went away to college, I actually went to college when I was 16 years old. And, um, I played field hockey. So my parents would come up and visit me for my field hockey games. And that was like the only times that I would really see them was when they would come see me for my field hockey games. And that distance was what I really needed. And also seeing the relationships that other people had with their parents, like was kind of crazy. Like people's parents would like come up and like do all this stuff for them. And I'm like, what? what's happening here um but then my parents started doing that um and it was really cool and like we got to build like a pretty strong relationship from a distance um and then eventually I when I was in college I decided I wanted to be an activist and um my my dad was less than thrilled about that um but then on top of it he was less than thrilled about the fact that um I was advocating for older men who'd been incarcerated um and I didn't meet him with any compassion when he came home. I was very rude to him. Um, and now that I wanted to spend my life supporting individuals who've been impacted by the criminal legal system, he felt really hurt by that. Um, so it kind of forced us into a conversation that ended up being really healing for us. Um, and now we have a great, solid, stable relationship, um, kind of similar to you and your dad, where we're just buddies. Um, and yeah, but I think that not having that connection like while he was in jail like really messed things up because it made it like okay like now he's this whole other person that we don't even like like he's a totally other now that he's had this experience um I think that was really damaging to his re-entry process I really like that you said I never thought about it this way well actually I have but I never chose to acknowledge it this way when you said um, there was no re-entry because there was 
no healing. And that's so true. Like, are you really re-entering society if you're not doing what needs to be done to become an active member of a community and society in itself? And uh, I think that's just so important to acknowledge because, you know, is re-entry really happening if you aren't doing the work on your part? You know, that's kind of like stuff my dad said when I asked him, you know, his questions. Um, so that's like really powerful to see and hear. Um, so what about uh, you, Jamila? Like, how did, you know, the relationship or lack of relationship uh, impact? you know, you building a bond with your parent after they came home? I would say that the conversation was necessary to have, like, the reality check. Like, you know, I know there's an illusion to re-entry that, hey, everything will be back to normal. We can have this happy life. But that's not true. The more you try to push towards that illusion that you have created is the more hurt and trauma that's created in the process. So, for me, it's more of like setting healthy boundaries and saying, hey, you hurt me in this way. Whether you're aware of it or not, like you hurt me. And in order for us to move forward, we have to acknowledge it. And also something that like a main idea to my healing process and my father's re-entry was understanding that it's a privilege to have access to me. Like for me, at a young age, I always understood that not everybody can have access to you. And there's a season and there's a reason behind everything. So, yes, we went through this. I had to experience it at a young age. And that doesn't mean that needs to be our reality forever, but it does need to be acknowledged. You need to understand that I'm not the same young lady that you knew when you went in. You know, I had went through a whole different walk of life because I didn't have my father there. So I think for me, my mentality has shifted. And I went through so many different emotions because I also experienced what you experienced, Chantel, with that idea of your mother saying, I'm your mom and your dad. Oh, like, you know, that single parent mentality thinking like we were raised to believe like you don't need like if you have this, you're blessed, you're good. You have your set for life. You're living good. But understanding growing up, I understood once I got older, it's like, yes, that I'm sorry, guys, I got a little cold, but it's fundamental to have two parents in the household and me not having my father home. It caused me to experience things from a different perspective. I if I I always would think like, what if I had that wisdom that he had? What if I was able to have these uncomfortable conversations? What if I had the safe space outside of my mother and my home? So for me, moving forward right now, where we are is not the ideal place I would imagine us to be, but I can say we have grown a lot. And I went through every stage of emotions from the moment that I seen him. I was joyful. I thought I believed in the illusion. I thought like, hey, everything is fine. Like, you know, I even saw like to share something like I have an older brother and our our reaction to his reentry was totally different. My my older brother he was so joyful because he never had a father figure like for me I had my grandfathers I had a stepfather but he never had that so he instantly glued to my father and my father expected that from me as well and for me personally it was like wow like I was hurt I was still hurt in the process but I wasn't acknowledging my emotions but to summarize it because I know we're tight on time I think for me is something that I do want to leave people with. It's like, yes, there's amazing stories. There's amazing outcomes that can happen. But you got to understand that there's a privilege for people to have access to. And there's a process. There's nothing is overnight. What people put out there is not always the truth. You got to understand that you got to extend grace to yourself and extend grace to the person that was incarcerated because the system that's created in America is often put against our people and I really like I don't want to get into the politics right now but when you really look and you put yourself in their shoes as well you understood that they were placed in a position where they only got to know a routine 
So once they're placed in the outside world, they were just slapped in the in the face with reality. A lot of these people have been in the streets since they were younger because that's all they ever knew. And it's this mindset of poverty. And it's a lot. It's honestly very challenging to escape that. We can sit here and we can judge the process. But the process, for a lot of people to really go through the process, it's not easy. Not too many people get through it. So I think it's important that we extend grace and we got to understand that there's so much happening in the world right now. And we need to cherish those that we do have. And we need to cherish what we do have. So, yeah, that's my take on that. I love all the advice you're giving. So that's, yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to share advice. But before that, I will get into the politics. Yes, everything was built in a system that is against us. It's not built to see it succeed. Everything is, you know, it's institutionalized. Everything has a, a pipeline to incarceration, uh, group homes, foster care, even the way that the projects are built. Everything is built to have you ready to be an incarcerated person. Um, so all we can do on our part um, as a starter is just be the best version of ourselves and give ourselves that passion and that that grace, you know, and that understanding to really push us into reality. You know, it starts with you. What can you do for the community? What can you do to combat the system that is not built for you um, without, you know, mending your own self you know um, I definitely want to add on to that and I want like for anybody on a panel that has experience going on a visit so I really want to get into that really quickly I know we didn't have that on the lineup but when you're going on a visit no matter your age it feels like you're also being incarcerated as well you're being stripped of your innocence stripped of your privacy and the whole system of you going to visit your loved one, you're instantly being incarcerated right with them. You don't have the right to speak. You lose your rights. And it's like when you look at that, I don't think people really see it like that. Like people don't understand that kids are being impacted by this. Just imagine how many people in the world right now had a parent that's incarcerated and it's a conversation that's had and it's like, it's the norm. It's like, oh yeah, my father was incarcerated. He did time, but he's fine now. And oftentimes people want to brush past it and brush it under the rug and they don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation and there's a lot of healing that's not done so now we have people that's angry now crimes are increased people are in the survival mode the system is placed in a position puts people puts our people in a position where they're in survival mode and it's like survival of the fittest literally and when your father was speaking on his re-entry process and he mentioned that I was trying just to do anything to not go back. I wouldn't even jaywalk. And that right there was so real because it's like now, not only now you got out on bail or now you got out and you're on probation, but you're, pro you're on probation for 14 years. So you walk, you talk wrong. Now I have the right to take your freedom. So a lot of people don't like to look at it like that. And that's really the reality of the world we live in today. And a lot of us need to acknowledge that, like, you know, the system isn't made to work with us and oftentimes it's made to work against us. And it's understanding, like, I want everybody, when we leave this call, to understand that you have the power to speak up for your community. You have the power to be the voice and be the change that you constantly seek. It's amazing to talk about how many things are going wrong in society right now. But if you're not constantly actively being a part of the change, it doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change. Like the power is within you. Whatever you want to see change, if that's prison reform, if that's police brutality, immigration, whatever it is, use your voice. Get in your community. See how you can make a change. You might be thinking like, there's so many problems, but focus in and do your part. Once we do our part as community members, that's when things shift. And I know this was one of the prior questions, but once I got into advocacy, my whole perspective on life changed because where I'm from, I don't see too many people. Like, it's not cool to be an advocate. It's not cool to be working with NYPD. It's not cool. That It's not cool. A lot of the people, they look at me and they're in survival of fitness fittest and I can't blame them because they're too deep into a situation that they were birthed into 
So it's understanding that like, you gotta you gotta do what's uncomfortable in that season in your life to move forward. When I got into advocacy, I was twelve years old. My situation may have looked different from other people. I know people that had a parent that was incarcerated and now they, they became the men in their household. So now they went in the streets and they they so they got into the survival of the fittest and then they ended up incarcerated with their father, similar to the video. For me, I went ahead and I started a business. I went ahead and I just started working, working, working. I opened my own salon and stuff like that. And for me, in that process, I didn't even know I was neglecting my own emotions because it looked different. People would see me and be like, oh, girl, you're killing. I'm so proud of you. And I was proud of me, too. But in that process, I didn't realize, like, hey, you still, you're still hurt. It's okay. We need to talk about that. And it's a norm. Like, it's, it's important that in our community we speak that therapy. It's okay to go to therapy. It's okay to have these uncomfortable conversations. It's okay to go surround yourself with people that ex are experiencing similar things. And that's when Osborne Association came in handy for me because I was like, I'm not the only one going through this. I'm not the only one that feels alone. I'm not the only one. So yeah, that's my take on that. Y'all, I need to sneeze. <laughs> no, you did that. Needed to be said. Everything you said needed to be said. Um, you know, I'm glad I brought you back to that too, because you needed to say that. And a lot of what you said too is also in our podcast. If y'all want, you have to go on the Susu website and check out the podcast we did. Um, yeah, we're like running over time, but just real quickly, I guess, you know, if, I mean, uh, Jamila already shared some, but what's some advice you guys would have for families, you know, navigating and dealing with reentry? I say don't give up. Um, especially if there's a little bit of hope in you that you'll get that relationship that you want. Um, understand that you can only control yourself in the process. You can't control the relationship that someone else is going to give to you because the relationship is always um, more than one person involved. So there's more than one side. You can't expect one person to be doing everything. Um, do, an, do a lot of check-ins with yourself, like recognize what you want, what you can give and where you are, because there's definitely some limits that can get hit, um, especially when like these are these are important relationships. And I, I think like the, the thing that's kind of built into this whole system is like the idea of like being fine all on your own. Like that's that's inhuman. Like no one is actually perfectly OK, totally by themselves like people need people that's we're social creatures we need support we need to be able to lean on others um so when we put people in the system we're shutting them down from the outside world from the opportunity to um have a lot of really important relationships and uh what we can do when we come home is be able to have grace obviously not everything's going to be perfect right off the bat if it ever would be. Um, but we can have patience, give grace and hope for the best and just keep trying. I agree with everything you said, Ava. Um, I think some advice I would give is um, leave your comfort zone. You know, you are not going to become the, the person, the version of yourself that your children and your family need by staying where you're comfortable. Like growth and healing always requires you to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So, you know, maybe you weren't someone who is open to being in programs and having this kind of community, but what you don't want is sometimes exactly what you need. You need those support systems, those communities, those programs. Like my dad said, my dad has never had no issue with substance abuse, yet he still did a AA program. So, you know, like just, just put yourself out there and, you know, do, do these things um, because you can, everything is a learning experience. You can learn from everything you, everything you involve yourself in and thrust yourself into. Um, so yeah, you know, leave your comfort zone um, and allow yourself community so you can have that positive change. Yeah, and to what Ava L was saying, like the idea that you can't, um, like you need support from others around you and that it's okay not to just like do it everything by yourself. I think that's a really important idea because, um, and I know you were saying this, but 
it, it can feel really isolating to have a parent in prison um, just because there's so much stigma around it and you can feel like there's nobody out there to support you but there are people who you have in your corner just to like remember that when you feel down. Um, okay, so since it's already like late, should we get into the questions from the audience? Um, Allison, I yeah. think something quick we can you. touch on real quick is how do you move forward? Like to for all the panelists to answer, like what is like one tip you would give for somebody to move forward? Well, I would say, um, you know, see your parents as your parents, you know, don't stigmatize them. Don't let how anyone else perceives them um, dictate how you decide to treat them or let that establish the relationship that uh, you have with them. Like, just focus on, you know, what your parent is doing for you and how they want to become a better version of them for you and your guys' bond. To piggyback off of that, um, remember that we're all human. You know, our parents are human who, who've made mistakes and we've made mistakes ourselves as well. Um, it can be harder to forgive some, but we're forgiveness is for you. It's not for the other person. Um, so just remember to wor work on your healing journey and uh, focus on yourself first. Yeah, and I would say that like the process itself is something that happens between you and your incarcerated parent. And so there's only really one side of that equation that you can control and that's your like yourself. And so do the things that you need to do. And in some ways you have to have trust that the other side will, will keep up their end of the bargain. Yeah, I also wanna add like um, for the parents to just accept that they need support. Like if, there's a saying like it takes a village to raise a child so what makes you think as someone who's never even acknowledged your own most likely like you have childhood trauma who's never even acknowledged your own inner child like what makes you think that you don't need that village to support you and you know help build you up so yeah they also need to take it seriously like take yourself seriously don't um doubt yourself like my dad had said um, that you cannot become a better parent. You know, there's all of us, even just for everyone, there's always some way, shape or form that we can be better. And it's most important to do it for you first and also your family and your children, you know? So accept that you need help, take yourself seriously and don't, you know, have low expectations for yourself. Okay, that was great. I kind of touched on my answer, like when it comes to communication, therapy, um, and surround yourself with people who you envision to become like. I think that's really important. Like, community is everything. I used to be one of the people that'd be like, I don't need nobody. I'm gonna, but being around people yeah. that are in a space where you desire to become, it inspires you. You pick up different habits and stuff like that. It helps you evolve. <laughs> I see some questions in the uh, Q&A thing. Yeah, let's see. There was one, someone who had a really good question. I don't know if she put it in the Q&A. Um, let me see. Okay, maybe like my dad can like, wait, I don't know if he's here. But it says, um, what would you tell a father who is with his sons in the prison system? when the kids misbehave how much or dad are you hearing the question um what was the question okay i'm reading it what would you tell a father who is with his sons in the prison system when the kids misbehave how much or little should they be involved on the not fun parenting the dad doesn't want his little time with them to be on their case so is that raising a child from a guilty place I'm I'm kind of confused. Hold on. Um, I think they're asking like, um, you know, how much should an incarcerated parent, like, I guess, discipline and parent their child from being incarcerated, oh, like from their position? Wow. 
like because they just don't want to spend their time speaking to that child just you know getting on their case oh sort of like parenting from a distance but you're parenting while you're in the system yeah it, it, it's kind of tough it depends like to me it depends on what age bracket that child is in you know if it's a teenager good luck like you he, can't sit there at eight they're eight eight years old when um I don't know. That that's tough. That's tough because is you you can try your best to parent and, and be a disciplinary from from that from that distance and 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 hope that it'll turn out right. But but the to me the best example you can you can you can you can give a child at that age is to try to be uh supportive with with the other parent. You know that's something that. The other parent has to step up with you about if 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 the other parent is allowing you to have your eight year old child in your life if you're incarcerated as well like it, that's that's tough because and um Jamila touched on this earlier stating that you know when you go on a visit it's like you're incarcerated no the incarceration is before that because once one when one person is locked up in a household everybody is kind of locked up because it's a ripple effect. You know, so it's tough to try to parent from that distance and be in a position that, you know, you can you can use yourself as an example. Like, you know, you see what you see what for me, like, you know how some parents used to scare their kids to say certain things to make them do good. Like, hey, if you don't listen to your mama, you're going to end up where I'm at. And you don't want to be where I'm at and stuff like that. You know, certain things you can do to like, you know, but it's difficult. It's very difficult to do that, you know. Like for me and you guys, I didn't really have that that chance to communicate with you guys while I was incarcerated. So it was tough. So and even when I came out, for me to sit there and try to discipline you guys, it's like, who are you? Like, where you been at? I know you my dad, but you can't tell me what to do. Like, you don't take care of me. Like, you can't tell me what to do. Like, that type of response, sometimes people will get that. You know, but it's I also think it's like at eight true. years old, I think a child at that age is old enough to be given like reality because I don't mm -hmm. know if it, me personally, I was very like aware at eight years mm -hmm. old. So if you told me like, you know, like this is like she said in the comment, like and in the child's mind, he thought he could go to jail too. like, yeah, start dealing with their reality, like let them know like right. this is like, you know, a serious thing and it's not fun being incarcerated. And I think as far as on the dad's part, he should just like find a balance with that. Like when it comes to discipline, like maybe he doesn't like do the harsh, like, you know, real getting on their case thing. But because of his position, he is the parent who gives them the optimism, who is breathing the life into them. Whereas you will deal with the more like uh, outer world discipline kind of thing. Um, that was like a real personal question. So I hoped, you know, that helps you in some way. Um, there is a question. Where was it? For you too, dad. Um, Mr. Jackson, do you feel like having those family ties and connections gave your reentry a boost in a positive direction as opposed to trying to do it without it? Um, definitely, definitely. Because if I didn't have access to, uh, I did my own research. It's not like any, any, any numbers were, uh, that I had any phone numbers on hand or anything like that. Like I did my own research when I came out, knowing that I wasn't really too computer savvy, but I remember names you know, and I kind of looked your granddad up on, uh, I think, was it MySpace? I think it was that. And I think I contacted him on that, you know, and stuff like that. So once I did that, like, it, it made everything easier. But if I didn't have that connection, you know, I, I probably would have been lost and been a little bit discouraged about everything. But and at the end of the day, it's like I felt like so much of me was missing. So I don't. I think I still would have uh, remained relentless in regards to you know seeing my children again. You know because I gave a f. I really did. So if you don't care and, and it's not something important to you and you're gonna 
focus on getting what you want and what you need and not realizing what you need is that that connection with your children because it's a it's, it's it's basically as a part of you you know and, and that's important to me you know that's important so yeah it was it, it would have been tough if I didn't have that connection but it wouldn't have deterred me personally I was still trying to find a way like like I said I didn't have a number I I, I, didn't know, I wasn't really too computer savvy I know I just jumped on my space and say, oh, let me type in a person's name and it popped up and it worked, you know, so, you know, you just got, you, you just got to keep pushing, even though if you don't have the, the, all the uh, connections, you have to make them your own. You have to come up with a way, find a way. Very well said. Um, For the youth team members, um, did the experience, especially in the younger years, make you feel like you needed to grow up a lot quicker than most and did it make you feel like you had to act like an adult yes <laughs> like how can um, adults help children be children still that's a great question um I think the the whole process of just your your parent coming in to encounter the criminal legal system like really rocks your world like you're not a child anymore um you grow up really quick you um I found out that my dad was in jail swinging on a uh on the swings and some kids came up to me and they were like hey your dad's in jail my parents didn't I was never sat down and told like by my family like your dad's in jail he'll be home on this date um he just like went away and no one talked about it and then um I also witnessed the arrest of my mom, which was really traumatic because the police officers there just weren't really informed on how to have a child sensitive arrest. Um, so it really forces you to grow up really quick. Like now all of a sudden you don't have a whole, there's a whole person missing from your home. Like you have to fill those gaps in ways that can't really be filled. So that means your whoever your caregiver is, is already trying to overcompensate for that person, you're probably frustrated because they'll never be able to fill that gap because they're simply not that person. So then you start overcompensating for stuff as well. And that's when you get into your own process of, oh, well, my dad went to jail. That means I'm a criminal too. So I'm going to go do this, this, and this. Um, and I'm not going to listen to the other person who's trying to raise me anymore. And I'm going to worry about myself because who, what do they know? Um, and you can really, you can go pretty deep, far down that, um, and you can really push your parents away. That's what I did. I really pushed them away. Um, and I had no interest in acting like I had parents growing up. Um, I had them, they were there, uh, but they didn't do a lot in terms of telling me what to do because they felt like they'd lost that authority. So that by them feeling like they couldn't even be my parents, I wasn't, I, I just in turn acted like I didn't have any. And um, it, it made growing up really difficult because a lot of those little things that like people go to their parents for, you teach yourself that you can't, even if you have them, even if you have access to that. Um, and yeah, it just makes you go up really quick. And the best way to be a parent in that situation is just to keep trying. Like, to be completely honest, I felt like my dad gave up on trying with me. Um, he kind of was just like, whatever, whatever happens, happens. Um, and that hurt me the most was when I realized that he stopped trying. And that was when I had to take a step back and say, okay, look, like I'm still the child, but maybe there's some things that I can adjust about the way that I'm handling the situation. And then that's when our relationship got better once I was old enough to take a step back. But as a child, things are so tunnel vision and you're just hurt. Like you just want a parent. You just want someone to raise you. And sometimes they just don't know how to step up to that role because it's kind of intimidating. So that's why we need things like parenting classes. Yeah, I could definitely, um, I resonate so much when you said like, you know, like as far as I know, like I just don't have parents, um, you know, because of my mom's incarceration, I had to grow up, uh, spend my teen years and my early adult years in the foster care system. So even though, you know, both my parents are here alive and well, that's just really what it felt like, especially since before my mom's incarceration, I already felt like an adult because of, you know, obviously like um, you're, there's things that happen before they get incarcerated that leads up to that experience. 
So that's all. I was already feeling like an adult, being an adult, doing adult things, taking care of my siblings, you know, Mm -hmm. just having responsibilities that I shouldn't have. Like there's no time at the mall. There's no time at your house with your friends. And um, so also I think that's one way to adults can help children be children is to not project like their own parental paranoia onto children. Like, I feel like that was like a huge thing I experienced so much and why that stifled me from having like a more like innocent, like youthful kind of childhood. Um, And I know like as parents, like you're always going to like worry about your children, but to the point where you're projecting that so much onto them where they don't get to like have regular childlike experiences um, can be really harmful. So overall, yeah, it definitely made me grow up a lot quicker because I had to go into foster care. And we know how extremely flawed and broken that system already is. So I definitely had to parent myself. And um, yeah. Uh, So now we're going to wrap it up. Um, Unless Ava, um, you want to say something real quick, because I know we went real deep, but we low-key got to wrap it up. Yeah, no, go for it. Okay, so we're going to turn it to Ava so she can, uh, you know, close us out. And thank you, everybody, for sharing. Thank you all for joining us for this imperative conversation on families navigating the reentry process. We ask that you all consider uh, children of incarcerated parents when you're creating policies and practices for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated parents um, and just interacting with us. Uh, Some notable points we shared today I'd like for you to keep in mind are one, for returning parents, um, have patience and keep showing up. Two, for family, um, families in the reentry process need support, like programs, empathy, and policy changes. Uh, And three, the reentry process is not linear. If you are a loved one on the reentry journey, hold space and grace, respect boundaries, and stay positive for your whole family during reentry. It's important to us that you do more than just hear our words. Please amplify them, put them into practice, share them with people in your life, see and support us. Um, if you do any work with government or a, or a, a lawmaker, um, help us remove the 44 thousand legal barriers that meet our parents when they come home from incarceration. One of the best ways you can support us is to help our parents access employment, housing, benefits, transportation, and stability. This is what our parents need to succeed in community, in the community, and as parents. Continue to see and support us all year by signing up for the SUSU Network newsletter. Follow us on social media and go to our website for research, calls to action, and perspectives of other youth like us. If you've had an incarcerated parent, visit the youth resource page, um, resources page on the SUSU website, and remember, you are not alone. Check out the new SUSU playlist on the Osborne Association's YouTube channel. This event will be posted soon, too. Thank you all very much for seeing and supporting us today.